or the muscle cell. Now, it is usually 100 microns to a few centimeters in length, and we have multiple nuclei on it. But what we should point out is that it is the smallest unit that can metabolize, get excited, and contract. Now, the cell membrane, also known as the sarcolemma, uh, is noted to invaginate the cell, making um, invaginations known as uh, transverse tubules and the cytoplasm is known as the sarcoplasm and it has various organelles including microfilaments, actin and myosin. Now we'll talk a little bit more about actin and myosin but um, these structures form the fiber looking like strands known as myofibrils. So you will observe um, that I have two diagrams there and um, what we have is the myofibril on the left di on the diagram on your left you have the myofibril which contains the filament that I'm talking about and these are covered with the purple membrane that is known as the sarcolemma. Now the sarcolemma if you could see these holes on your left side um, they literally invaginate, I mean, they go through making uh, what are known as T tubules, all right, or transverse tubules. Uh, now, in between um, or surrounding the myofibrils are pockets of calcium, and these are known as the sarcoplasmic reticulum. These are the ones that you're seeing as yellow. Now, the sarcoplasmic reticulum and uh, the T-tubules uh, have a pattern um, which is noted where they meet. So if you see um, the extract from the left diagram, we see that just by the T-tubules, you have the sarcoplasmic um, bulging out on either side, forming what is known as a triad. And this triad is really just two um, cystinae um, and a transverse tubule. Uh, which will lead to when we start talking about uh, the physiology. The diagram on the right is uh, again showing the sarcolemma with the transverse tubules uh, that are uh, going through uh, to the myofibril. And as I said, the myofibril are covered by the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And as, uh, as I again alluded earlier, these are bulged up forming cystinae and the terminal cystinae together with the T-tubules make what is known as a triad. So that is just for repetition's sake. Let's go on. All right, now let's just delve into what a myofibril is. So the myofibril is composed of long proteins, also known as filaments, and these repeat along the length of the myofibril. Um, the smallest unit of these repeating uh, filament uh, structures is known as a sarcomere. Now, if we look at uh, what is on the screen right now, what we are seeing is on the right side, we have a myofibril that is containing the sarcomere itself, which is the smallest unit um, of repeating unit, so to speak. So what we are seeing is a mixture of thick filaments and thin filaments and from the structure on the right you can see that the thin filaments are the ones that are coming in from the z lines or the z lines uh, on either side of the sarcomere and then we have from the m line the middle line um, thick filaments that are coming out and these intertwine and um, during a contraction you will note that there's pulling of uh, the z lines closer to the m line now that is very much seen on um, uh, 
the figure on the left. So the diagram on the left is showing the M lines as uh, the, the thick ones, uh, uh, sorry, the thick lines as blue rather, and then the reddish, uh, maroonish lines as the thin ones. Now, we could go off from here and just say the thick ones are the myosin and the thin ones are the actin. So from the middle, we have the thick lines um, pulling in uh, the thin lines and then from uh, the Z line you have one Z line moving closer to another Z line uh, during uh, contraction. Another component that you would be um, that would be good to note is the I zone and the edge zone which we'll talk about soon but taking away from this um, uh, here is the fact that the myofibrils are an ordered arrangement of longitudinal filaments. And what are these filaments? We have the thin filaments and the thick filaments. The thick ones are known as myosin and the thin ones are known as actin. And so they uh, form this observable uh, striation. If you look through the microscope, you actually see that there are light and dark bands in this longitudinal uh, section. Let's talk about uh, these zones and bands a little bit more. So as I said, uh, the I band, which is also known as the light band, is consistent only of um, the thin filaments. If you see, there is no intertwining, um, there's no merging of thick and thin here. So you only see red um, in that area while the dark band which is also known as the a band okay so you see just below uh, the edge um, is made up of thick filaments okay um, you will also observe that the Z lines, uh, also known as the Z disc or the Z band, they define the lateral units of uh, sarcomeric units. So from one Z line to the next Z line, that is one sarcomeric unit. So let's go through this again with the next diagram to re-explain what all these mean. All right, so what do we have here? Um, I'm going to start with the entire uh, section, the longitudinal section on top there. So from the left, what we have in blue are the thin uh, filaments. And then uh, we have an M line in um, orange there. And uh, then we go to the Z disc. And the Z disc, uh, between um, where the, from the from where the thick filaments are ending to where the next thick filaments are ending, we have this component that's just for the thin uh, filaments that's known as the I band, and then the component where we have thick bands and sometimes you actually see that they are merging or not merging but intertwined with the presence of the thin ones who we'll have the a band there uh, then we again have an i band and then the sarcomeric units go uh, on just like that then on the diagram in the middle, uh, it has been simplified for us to um, really see what is happening here. Um, so from the Z line, one Z disc to one Z disc, uh, what you have coming out of it are the blue um, lines there. So the blue lines are the thin filaments. Okay, and if you can see these are attached to the discs, um, the Z discs. Then 
what we have in the middle is the M line and from the M line we have our myosin which are the thick filaments and these don't just you know uh, stop and linger waiting for the Z disc to draw nigh but the the pulling uh, closer is not only because of the activity of the myosin on the on the actin but hey it is also heavily weighed on this structure of the elastic uh, titan that is between uh, the uh, myosin and the z-lines so you see that there's an amount of um, attachment uh, of the titans uh, to the z-lines that's a very good thing to, to take note of um, then what we have down here are the cross-sectional view of each of, of the sarcomeric units or sarcomeric components so the eye band you see only has the blue component which is the thin filaments and then we have the H zone which is um, which we haven't talked about until now the H zone is thick filaments only okay so um, I think we also saw that in the previous section then we have the M line which is um, the thick filaments linked by accessory proteins uh, this is the middle line then we have the outer edge uh, components of the air band so this is where there's a mixture or an overlap of both thick and thin I wish there was uh, another one showing us the, the z discs in a cross section but we'll see if i can get one of those just for perspective Okay, let's just uh, try to appreciate uh, myosin. So myosin is made up of two types of proteins. We have, um, it's a six polypeptide uh, structure. Uh, we have a pair of um, large heavy chain uh, proteins and two pairs of light chain uh, proteins. So the heavy chains are these ones that you are seeing that are woven around each other, sort of making a helix. And then they end in a, glo a globular type of um, uh, structure. And the globular components, if you see, um, are have two sides so you have the blue part which is the myosin head of the heavy chain um, and it has the end terminus and then you have the orange part there that has um, two binding sites one is the myosin ATP site which we'll talk about very soon and the other is the actin binding site these are very important now in order for these two heads to move we need um, the light chain structures here so the head has this light chain for control of the, the movement of these two uh, globular components and of course the rest of the structure which is helical ending in a C terminus act as um, the tail component so when they are lumped together these chains actually look as though they've got protruding arms and then the rest of it uh, like tails we'll see on uh, the next slide and uh, it should be pointed out that very very vital to the physiology is these actin binding sites as well as the myosin ATP site so as pointed out earlier we have this structure where you have the tail the myosin tail component if you look at the diagram just at the bottom d uh, the molecule itself is such that there's the tail component and then you have the hinge made out of the light chains and then you have the two heads that have sites um, for actin and another one for atp and when these are lumped together as thick filaments they look uh, like the structure in c 
where the heads are protruding out and then the tails are forming sort of the longitudinal structure. Uh, not to forget, we have, of course, the titan component which bind or which are connected to the Z lines and uh, these provide the muscle with elasticity. So it's uh, vital for us to just uh, appreciate these components of myosin. All right, now, actin. Actin is made up of three proteins. Okay, now these proteins make up uh, the entire filament actin. So we have actin itself, which is um, a globular uh, G-actin protein. And uh, this one has sites on it for myosin uh, where myosin can bind. Um, and what happens is that they form this strand um, made, uh, known as F-actin and two F-actins wind up uh, making a double helical actin strand that we can see in the structure on the right. Um, so that is where the G-actin um, ends. So we have it as a globular structure and then it forms a, a strand named as F-actin and these wind up uh, on themselves to f uh, form this double helical acting strand. What we should know is that there are active sites where myosin can bind. Uh, secondary to actin is tropomyosin and troponin. Now, tropomyosin is a strand protein that wraps around this F actin helix. So, what it does is it lies on top of the active sites. So, remember, I said that, that these active sites where myosin can um, bind. So, you've seen them as black dots here. And then we have tropomyosin, which is the pink like um, I think it's pink it's a pink like actually uh, pink like strand that covers uh, these um, particular um, myosin uh, sites okay so in a state of rest where there's no contraction you will notice that that is actually the the structure that you will find now We'll talk about the troponin complex soon, but uh, the last the, the the last structure there that is showing um, gray and brown again is just really showing us the helical structure with the strands on it, and then uh, the components of uh, troponin which we are just about to discuss. So let's talk about the troponin uh, component. So this is a complex of proteins and um, it is attached along the sides of tropomyosin. Uh, so if you can see on A, the diagram there, that B, um, you have tropomyosin and then on components of it, you have uh, the troponin. And you can see on the diagram at the bottom that it's just not one structure, it's actually a complex of uh, proteins. So we have three loosely bound proteins. So you have troponin I, which has an affinity for actin, and then you have troponin T, which has an affinity uh, for tropomyosin. So this is sort of the one that binds to tropomyosin. And then you have troponin C, which has a very high affinity for calcium. Uh, so T binds to the um, strand, and then I binds to the actin. So that sort of uh, in itself acts as a glue uh, between uh, the strand as well as the, uh, the actin.
Now, let's just review some things here. The sarcolemma is an equivalent of a plasma membrane, and the sarcoplasm is a specialized cytoplasm of a muscle cell. And so we see that it contains elements including the Golgi apparatus, myofibrils, a modified endoplasmic reticulum known as a sarcoplasmic reticulum containing high levels of calcium, uh, mitochondrial and mitochondria and so on and so forth. Again, this is just a reminder. We have the sarcoplasmic reticulum, uh, which covers these myofibrils and is high in uh, calcium, having these terminal cystinae, and they um, surround the T tubules. And the T tubules, remember, are invaginations of the sarcolemma. And in a physiological perspective, we find that the action potential actually moves on the sarcolemma uh, from the end plate that we talked about uh, in class. Um, maybe point two, um, which states that at the points of contact, the arrangement of the central T system with the cystine of the uh, SR on either side has led to the use of the term triad. Uh, that emphasis is very vital. Thank you. Let's move on. Coming to the physiology of it, we really see that the T system uh, provides the path for the rapid transmission of action potentials. And the action potentials themselves move uh, from the sarcolemma to all the fibrils in the uh, muscles. So the SR, which is very imperative for uh, storage of calcium, will react to this movement of action potentials and we'll see in a bit how this is so. In order for us to appreciate what is happening, we're going to look at the electrical uh, mechanical uh, coupling, or should I say the electrical and mechanical response, which is contraction uh, coupling of uh, the physiology of muscle. As a review, we had our synaptic terminal uh, end of our neuron, a motor neuron, and uh, we saw that SCH was released and there was depolarization of the muscle cell. So we have an action potential that is moving across the, uh, along the sarcolemma and the action potential will propagate right into the transverse tubule. Now this will, this will cause a depolarization of, um, sorry, the depolarization of the transverse tubule will cause the release of calcium. And this is how it's going to happen. So how does this happen? Well, the sarcoplasmic reticulum itself has several uh, channels on its membrane, and these channels help release the calcium um, into the cytosol. One of these is known as ryanodyne. Now, ryanodyne uh, is activated by another receptor that is noted on the sarcolemma along the T-tubule, known as dihydropyridine receptor. So the DHPR is uh, voltage sensitive. You can call it a voltage sensitive, a voltage gated uh, receptor. Mm, so this voltage sensitive receptor is, de is activated by the depolarizing wave from uh, the neuromuscular junction. And upon activation, because of how close it is with the ryanodyne receptor, we find that it activates the ryanodyne receptor. And after activation, we see that it will undergo a conformational change, which will allow for the release of calcium uh, from uh, this um, SR. Let's see how that happens on the next slide. 
So as early as said, we have uh, a wave of depolarization coming through uh, the T tubules, and it hits the dihydropyridine receptors. These will undergo a conformation of change, and just because they are close to the ryanodine receptors, the ryanodine receptors will also change their conformation, and this will allow the efflux of uh, calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the cytosol of the uh, cell and this then will make the cytosol um, ready uh, for the mechanical response the whole intention of an electrical activity in this case is to make calcium available do not forget that at the end of the day we just need calcium available and you will notice why in the next few slides so this slide is bringing into perspective a few things like the relationship between the sarcoplasmic reticulum and um, the myofibril or should I say the filament uh, actin and myosin. Uh, so what we have here is the NMJ where SCH is released and then we have an action potential that is um, initiated at the motor end plate and this moves down to the T tubule and there we meet the uh, DHPR and when the DHPR is uh, distorted we see that because of the vicinity um, how close it is with the ryanodine receptor, we see that the ryanodine receptor also undergoes a conformational change which allows the efflux of calcium, which is in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, into the cytosol. And now that calcium is available, it can act on this myosin actin relationship. Um, and in order to appreciate this, you have to go back and appreciate uh, the troponin, tropomyosin actin um, structure as well as the myosin structure. So if you have forgotten this, please go back and just uh, review this component. What is the mechanical response now that we have the calcium? So what? So remember that the actin uh, filament uh, has active sites that are at this point surrounded by strands, uh, strands of tropomyosin and that troponin is holding these in place because they have this part that has an affinity for tropomyosin and another component that has an affinity um, for the actin itself. But recall that the troponin has a third component that is um, has great affinity for calcium and remember that now we have calcium that is readily available so the calcium that is released into um, the cytosol from the SR binds to the troponin remember that component the third component of troponin so this Upon binding, you see that tropomyosin, um, there will be, up, upon binding, there will be a configurational change uh, in this uh, three structure uh, troponin, which will allow the tropomyosin to sort of shift away, to move away from the sites, making these sites that were hidden now available uh, to uh, myosin. Remember that on the myosin side, we already have have um, a component that is um, that has an affinity or that can bind to these sites so at the bottom here we have um, myosin in green with the actin uh, binding site um, uh, shown there um, and then we also have our troponin that has an affinity for tropomyosin, uh, for actin, and now that calcium is available for calcium. And in the second one, we see that upon calcium binding, um, it moves away the tropomyosin, and now actin is ready to bind. But before actin is ready to bind, myosin also has to uh, get ready to bind. So what do I mean by myosin has has to get ready to bind. Let's move on to the next slide. So the activation of myosin is such that um, the ATP binds to the myosin head and it is cleaved. So this leaves the myosin in this corked position that is ready to bind. Now the products ATP and organic phosphates are still attached and they 
energy is what results or what makes uh, the structure get into a corked position. Now, the activated myosin head binds, okay, because now we have actin ready, we have myosin ready, they bind. So upon binding, what happens? So what happens is that first of all, the phosphate is released, making the bond stronger. So this will initiate what is known as a power stroke of the mo or the moving of the actin towards the M line. But what makes it slide is actually the release of ADP. So once ADP is released, we see that the head of the of myosin will pivot and it will slide the actin right towards the center. And this in itself is what is known as a power stroke. So once the power stroke has happened, we observe that it leaves uh, this complex in what is known as a rigor state. Now, in order for this rigor state to uh, be weakened or this stiffness to be weakened, we need another ATP that has to uh, bind to uh, the myosin. Now, once this ATP binds, it, it will weaken the bond. Okay, and once it weakens the bond, it will detach from the um, actin. Now, in the next slide, we'll talk about then what happens uh, to the ATP that has bound. Uh, so what now that it has weakened? So now that we have ATP that is bound there and it has weakened the bond and it has detached, we can use this ATP for the next round. Guess what? So the ATP is uh, cleaved off and then we have ADP and the phosphate remaining as the energy is released and it goes back into this corked position. And as long as there is calcium available, actin will be uh, ready for binding and the cycle will happen all over again. And all this cycle is just that, is so that the actin is pushed towards um, the center line. And this is what is actually known as contraction. So if we look at this cycle here, um, number one says the myosin head first of all splits the ATP and becomes reoriented and and um, energized so that's the cocked position and then we see that the myosin head uh, bind to actin um, and, and at this point actin must be ready for binding so it uh, binds to actin forming what uh, they are also known as cross bridges so the myosin then rotates or moves uh, the actin towards the center and this is what is known as the power stroke in order to weaken that bond another ATP has to come bind and then that will detach and the cycle can go on and on and on until there's um, actin uh, inavailability so to speak so what happens in order for the muscle to relax because the contraction will go on and on and on as long as there's calcium so first of all the calcium is pumped back when there's no more action potentials coming in the calcium that 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 is in the cytosol is pumped back into the uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum and uh, we see this on uh, some of the pumps that are there on the sarcoplasmic reticulum itself such as um, the one uh, on number two there. Um, this reduction of calcium will imply that uh, calcium and troponin will be released. And thus, uh, we find that the myosin is covered uh, again, and sorry, the actin is covered again, and it won't be ready for um, binding with myosin. So on um, my right, we have uh, sodium-calcium exchanges um, in the plasma membrane 
can extrude calcium from the cell and two we have other pumps on the sarcoplasmic reticulum that take in uh, calcium to the uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum itself and it can also bind to uh, several um, proteins within the SR and that will make it unavailable so you will find that by the end of the day there's no more cross bridges that are made and relaxation will take place so the lack of action potential will thus lead to uh, decreasing calcium and therefore a cessation of interaction between actin and myosin and um, ultimately leading to relaxation. A few applications from this uh, statements that you will hear, such as rigor mortis, this is where the muscle fibers are depleted of ATP. So you don't have any ATP that is um, readily available to uh, release the actin myosin uh, born so to speak. You also have some lower motor neuron lesions uh, that lead to some fibrillations. This is where you have the nerve destruction leading to atrophy and you have abnormal excitability of muscles uh, because they're very sensitive to ACH. Um, muscular dystrophy is also another component which we will learn about um, with uh, um, very very soon uh, with one of our, doc our clinicians and this is really just progressive weakness of the skeletal muscle due to some mutations in the gene coding for dystrophy uh, glycoprotein complex uh, this is um, a link um, link of up into the surface membrane so we'll learn about that uh, to be particular uh, Duchenne uh, muscular dystrophy okay so please take notes and let's meet uh, in class where we'll re-explain some of the phenomena that you may not have understood and make some more applications.